Hello and welcome back to my channel. I am Zodiac Bandit, and today we're talking about Critical Role Campaign Three, Episode Two. And I thought it was good. I liked the episode. Uh, we're in the early stages of a campaign, so as a DM, I understand that sometimes it's a slow build to whatever the main problem is. So with that in mind, like if you still haven't watched the episode yet, don't know why you're here because I don't tend to shy from spoilers, but. Uh, with that in mind, if you are someone watching Critical Role for the first time, or watching any sort of D&D thing for the first time, uh, keep in mind, it's a story. Your main villain, and it's not like a book or a movie where you have X amount of time to get a story done, it's more like a video game. You have a lot more time to introduce your concepts, villains, themes, and all of that throughout the story. And I feel like the last two episodes are going to... Like the first episode and this episode. I feel like as somebody who doesn't understand that. And they're more expecting like a book. Like I want the conflict right away. Are going to be a little upset. And I'm not upset. I like this. I've, it takes a, takes time to get into this uh, kind of stuff. Especially with D&D. You got to get your characters or your players to... A certain point of understanding their location the people within the location and you know the general ideas of the world that you're in and right now very similar to the gentleman the players have immediately found themselves trying to help out a underground organization but it seems to be in my opinion more on the good side but i'll get into that in a minute so first of all the episode starts with the combat that was promised at the end of last uh, episode, which was the team versus uh, Ethos. Lord Ethos, I believe, or Master Ethos, I forget which one it was specifically that was said. And he seems to be rather, rather strong. A little old, but rather strong. And first thing of note that I want to talk about, because I took notes this time. I don't want to be... You know, having too many people having to correct me or... I don't care if you correct me, but... I would like to have at least... A little bit more of a memory. Because going into the last one, I was like... What did, you know, Ludna and uh, Imogen want at the school? And they totally said it right away. And for whatever reason, I just forgot when I came to do the video. So I don't want that to happen again. I want this to be insightful. And the first thing I have written down in my notes is... Chaos Burst? Because... What the hell is a chaos burst from good old Ashton? And then the next thing I have is Temporal Morask? Temporal Morask. Uh, I think that was also Ashton. Because those two things immediately happened. Or pretty quick in combat happened. And I was confused. I This is something that... Talzin likes to do. He likes to say something where only he and Matt know it. And then he'll laugh about it in 100 episodes when it finally comes out what it is. So, I just wanted to, you know, keep those two things out in the open for now. Uh, and I also started picking up a bit more on the combat styles of certain characters. Obviously, Imogen and Ludna try to run away from combat, away from their enemy, and get a little bit of distance so they can hit with their magic. Uh... Bertram Bell, he's a drinker. He doesn't like to fight, apparently. <laughs> that was funny. And then the next thing, FCG used... This is just an overall of the combat and things that I found were interesting within. FCG used something called Shared Suffering, which allowed him to split the damage. And me being a, you know, less not lesser informed... But I haven't been able to read the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount or the Ravenloft stuff. So I don't know if that's in it. But for whatever reason, I can't seem to picture where Shared Suffering is from. If it's something Matt came up with. If it's something that's in those books. I'm not sure. Because just like um, uh, Ludna. Her with her undead warlock, I believe. The undead patron or something. Uh, I know very little about it. Because that's in Ravenloft. And I know I have not read Ravenloft yet. And I should. 
and I'm going to now because I've learned that there are lots of cool things in it like that. So I'm going to do that. And the first person to go down was the guest character in Dorian. And yeah, kind of, I don't, I don't see why he was trying to be so close in combat. He, uh, he's definitely very squishy. So that was kind of a mistake, especially after seeing him, uh, him being Esteros. He kind of rampaged through shit and he looks like he has barbarian and fighter in him. He was, I think he was ta tanking some more damage than Matt was letting on. And then I asked myself, what level is this Lord Esteros guy? Because motherfucker is a beast. He is just rampaging through them at this point. And that was just after uh, Dorian went down. So I was mildly worried. I didn't know what, like, the intentions of this character weren't on the table yet. And it seemed at the end of the last episode that he wasn't too thrilled with what was happening. So I thought death might have been a possibility at this point. So I was a little worried for good old Dorian. Oh, and then uh, Esteros pulls his foot away from the blade like a beast. That was... That was nuts. I can only imagine. He turned his foot into a hoof. As I forget who said it. I believe that was Talzin. Turned his foot into a hoof. And then Ashton. Uh, trash talk and run. Uh, yeah. Form of dread. Obviously these are things that I've picked up since then. Because I looked at a little, of the, a little bit of the Ravenloft stuff. Um, and then there's some infighting. A little bit of a joke I think. From Ashton to Bertram Bell. And then eventually the the combat kind of settles in, or settles down, and they, uh, you know, oh, and I wrote this down, because, like, at the end of combat, uh, Fern and Ludna said that they were cool, like, that each other were cool, and they looked awesome, and then I wrote this down as a joke, people are going to ship them now, <laughs> so, yeah, and I've noticed that, people are shipping Ludna with, with, uh, with uh, Imogen already. I saw a couple of people on Twitter with uh, a very good art piece. I forget who it was by, but somebody was doing somebody's makeup. I forget who. And people were like shipping them already in the comments, which is very fast, people. Relax. <laughs> Give it a bit. Um, and then we learned that Bertrand Bell had helped uh, Esteros out before, but had lost most of his troop or all of his troop. And fled, like the coward he is, which again, for me, reinforces the fact that I believe truly that this character is an NPC quest giver player character thing, and yeah. And then another note that I had was Marisha, uh, best role player of the group. I can't get over how good she is. Her eyes constantly shifting, her head snapping back and forth, staring right at people without blinking while they're talking. Um, you know, it, it's just, I think this character is so different from her last two that I'm going to really notice her role playing. This character is like, I guess Keyleth would have been good. I, I hate alignment, but I'm going to use it for a minute. And Bo would have been neutral. This character feels like a chaotic, like, I don't want to say evil because I don't think she's evil. I guess that's how I'll put it. One's Kiki was lawful, in my opinion. Bo was really neutral. And it seems that Ludna is very chaotic. And she is very chaotic. She fucking pulls out a dead rat puppet. I love her. She's great. She is. She and FCG are currently fighting for my favorite character. As of right now. And then uh, FCG always judges a book by its cover. Fern with the light, line of the night. Last week it was uh, FCG. This week it's Fern with uh, you can suck my hair if you want to. I believe was the, the quote. I didn't write it down. All I wrote down was hair sucking question mark. Because I'm an idiot and should have wrote down the the, uh, the the quote. And then they left. A uh, few threats were tw uh, thrown toward uh, Bertram Bell. Uh, not so many people seem to like him. You know like it seems kind of rough. They then go to, after leaving Estheros' manor, I believe it was, uh, they go back to the 
spire uh, fire spire or the fire of or the spire of fire or something then that name is gonna fuck with me forever um but they go back to whatever inn they were at before and we get a lot of good character stuff the exu cast or at least orum oh geez at least orum says he's looking for a fresh start i would assume after something happens in exu that we haven't seen yet and hopefully they build toward that um SCG was born, or was created the way he is. Sorry, not he, they. My apologies. Um, FCG was created to heal people and be nice the way that, you know, he, the way that they are. You know, he's... I'm going to fuck that up so bad. Was it he, they? I'm just going to say that I find saying they very difficult still. So I'm going to say he for now. My apologies if that bothers, bothers people, but it's Sam, so Sam is a he. I'm just going to say he. My apologies. Um, FCG was built, you know, to heal people, to be nice, to heal people even if he doesn't like them, which was something brought up by uh, Bertrand Bell, I believe, at some point. He was, uh, FCG was, uh, Jesus Christ. He was more tricked out than his siblings were. He has a grappling hook to stand up because he has a wheel instead of feet. Um, and then Orem is very open about his Ashari past. We learned that Ludna was there in Whitestone before. Uh, before and a little after the coup on the Dorolos by the Briarwoods. And then she left after that and named her Rat... Parfait Dorolo, which is hilarious. I think that's great. Um, and she made this rat because she was lonely and didn't want to go insane. She needed someone to talk to, which is very insane. <laughs> um, Bell points out that he used to be part of uh, Vox Machina for like a single one shot. <laughs> and Ashton, the thing I picked up the most about Ashton is that he likes to say fuck a lot. I felt like at that in he said fuck at the end of every sentence or at the beginning of every sentence which is very close to my own heart I like saying fuck as well so after a bit of sitting and talking they decide they're going to take the job and the job is after they go back to Lord Esteros uh, is to find out what's happening at his storage facility and why find out why stuff's going missing who's taking it whatever with solid proof they get a little bit of pay beforehand, and they're going to get pay a uh, bit more pay after. So, <laughs> something that I noticed that Talzin likes to do a lot after playing Caduceus was roll for perception. So, Ashton is not as perceptive as Caduceus, which I feel like is very just. He is he has gone for something. He's gone for something basically the exact opposite of Caduceus in this in the fact that. Caduceus, for the most part, wouldn't hit people with, like up close, and now Ashton is. That seems to be his go-to. Well, it is his go-to. He's a barbarian. Um, Fern, the mega thief, finally gets caught trying to steal some sort of long stiletto at um, Esteros's place. Uh, is told to put it back. For two seconds, Bertram Bell believes he is the leader of the group again, until FCG cuts him back down. And the hammer might talk. The hammer on Ludna's head might also talk. I hope after that interaction that she had with uh, FCG about the hammer potentially talking, that she comes up with some sort of personality for the hammer. Something about being very destructive, like make the rat the devil, or make the rat the angel and the hammer the devil sort of thing on her shoulders. I think that'd be funny. Um, while in the storage facility because they make their way down and they break up into uh three different groups one group that goes into the building which was imogen fcg and orem one group to go around which was dorian ashton and and uh ludna and then a third group of bertram bell and fern just standing outside basically doing nothing while inside imogen uses something that she said like she opens her mind and she begins to start hearing more people talking and she has to make 
constitution checks until she ha takes a long rest now because of that. Um, FCG, we learn he has a way to cast Identify with his eyeball. He has a little lens for it. Um, we learn that the stuff that's being stolen seems to be some sort of rocks that allow cities to fly back in the old days and then allows the uh, flying ships to work now. Uh, those were inside the boxes. Ashton is capable of casting Pass Without a Trace, which is mind-boggling. Like, what kind of a barbarian is the, the type to thieve? I think that's hilarious. He's a, he's a very interesting character. He also likes to break and enter. Um, we learn from the third group uh, with Bertram Bell, which, again, informs me that he is some sort of information giver character rather than a player. And he is two levels above other people, above the rest of the cast, and just something about him and his the amount of information he has really makes me think he's going to introduce a new character at some point. Maybe not in the next three or four episodes, but at some point Bertrand Bell feels like he's going to leave because of the amount of information he has. So because of him, we learn about the Ivory Syndicate and how no one gets caught like, it's very rare for it to happen. And something called the Quorum might be working with them. It seems to be a group of higher-ups in the city. Uh, and that some of them might have connections. And that's why they don't get caught. Um, and yeah, I, with that information, he's Bertrand Bell feels like he is still a quest giver. And I will not give up on this until Travis shows up as my rogue. God damn it, Travis, show up as a rogue. And then Fern says that she wants them all dead, but she's only kidding. Or is she? Um, back inside with the infiltration group of Orem, Imogen, and FCG, Danis, one of the people working within the facility, uh, is getting her uh, mind read by either Imogen or FCG, one of the two of them, is reading her mind, and she feels uncomfortable. She wants them out. She wants them to get out because, well... She just kept saying she wants to send them out. Get out, get out. Uh, up on the roof, uh, Ludna finds a rolly case, as they put it. And then eventually, because I'm not going to just, I'm not going to hold on to this, they eventually open it and find a bit of money, which is whatever. One of the, one of the uh, workers says that they, they're going to go to a theater and they want to go watch the or they want to go, the team want to go with them or, you know, kind of hidden from them and kind of learn more about the workers to see if maybe they're the ones stealing from F uh, Esteros. And then they elect to not do that. And they elect to stay behind and watch the storage facility instead and wait to see if people break into the place or if something suspicious happens with the workers who remain. So then... They break off into two teams. Team Backdoor, Ashton, Fern, Ludna, and FCG, the four of them. Uh, a, a drunk ends up walking by, passing out because they were drunk. And then Fern and Ludna immediately start rummaging through his pockets. And they find only a couple of copper, a couple of silver. And no, a more noble side of Ashton comes out. And he says, that's kicking a man while he's down. Which is very true. He's a drunk, hobo, no money, and taking whatever he does have is very much kicking him while he's down. Team Front Door, Imogen, Dorian, Orem, and Bell watch the front door, obviously, and watch as the some of the workers begin to leave. Eventually, Orem gets turned invisible. He sneaks in and watches or hears. I forget if the lights were on at the time. Uh... Danis, one of the workers, the one who is uncomfortable, grab a couple of stuff, and then while is invisible, turns out the lights, or while Orem is invisible and inside the room, turns off the lights, or turns out the torch light, and then locks Orem in there without knowing it. And then Bell and Imogen immediately run after Danis. Uh, the others try to help Orem get out, and that's where the session ends. So, like I said at the beginning, uh, the story is beginning to unravel a little bit more. Maybe we're going to learn as to why this Danis character is stealing from Etheros. They 
like you have to have connections to work with him and she seems she or he i forget seems to know uh that it's ethro she's stealing from and it seems odd to me that this character would do this once they have this connection because it's supposed to be a very lucrative connection it seems very lucrative because you're not supposed to know about him or know exactly what he's operating under or doing with his certain facilities and people don't know he owns them uh as time went on more like fern went into the storage facility initially with the she left she left bertram bell and went into the facility and they were saying like hey we're not a sales shop we're just a storage facility and you're not even supposed to really know about us so you know it seemed these people like this connection seemed very strong so whatever is making Dennis break this connection must be better or far more lucrative. Maybe something to do with this Ivory Syndicate that we were learning about just beforehand by Bertram Bell. And maybe it has something to do with this Quorum group, the rich benefactors of the city and potential workers with the Ivory uh, Syndicate. So yeah, I... Uh, if you're looking for a fast-paced story, uh, then you're not looking at D&D. I want to get back to that point from earlier. I think for a lot of people, and I didn't look at Twitter for any of this, but I just remember from the first session that a lot of people were like, nothing happened. That's not how D&D works. Even in, like, like I pointed out the connection earlier with the video game connection, a video game takes a little while to get into its uh, initial plot as well. Certain games don't. I can point out Skyrim that doesn't get into its what its true plot is, uh, but other games like Pokemon, the in my opinion, the true plot is, you know, beating. You know, there's two true plots in Pokemon, like beating the evil team and then beating the league and the gym leaders. But you don't necessarily start off knowing about the evil team. You start off knowing about this, which I feel is that's your character motivation to move forward, and then you have a story motivation or a story plot to follow, and that's very much like D and D. Your character motivation is trying to push you forward to do things to reach your goal and eventually something else comes up that allows you to reach your goal at the same time and i very much think that we're getting to that central story to push everyone forward already with imogen and ludna we're gonna be able to have them go into the school once they help etheros Eth out a bit etheros esteros i forget how to, one of the two i'm gonna get filleted for not knowing the name but he, uh, he has these connections for them, so their motivation is there. We still don't quite know the motivation of the rest of the characters. It seems Ashton is just interested in getting a bit more money, and FCG wants to do whatever Ashton does. But then we have the EXU cast, whose motivations, in my opinion, are really unclear as of right now, which I think is good. It allows me to be more invested in Orem. I was already invested in Fern and Dorian, and Orem, in my opinion, was the one character in EXU that I thought was lacking a bit too much. But right away, they showed off a connection with the Ashari and Vox Machina and all of that. And even with Imogen, no, not Imogen, with Ludna, her hatred of the Dorolo family because of the way they were before the Briarwoods. You know, there's a connection between Orem and Ludna now because of that. Which I think is rather fascinating that they're on opposite sides of the coin. So... You know, overall, a very good episode. Overall, a uh, a fun time. And I'm really excited to see what's next with it. I think that... I think... <laughs> Matt, during the Critical Role Campaign 2 wrap-up, alluded to the fact that there was a split in going up the good path or the bad path. And I think we're going to get to that path a lot sooner with these characters. I think Esteros is supposed to be the good path and the Ivory Syndicate is going to end up being the bad path. And I personally feel, based off most of these characters, they're going to go to the good path this time. And I think Matt just wants to introduce Matt Koval really bad and just get him in the game. Uh, no, I'm kidding about that, that last part. But I do think they're going to go down the good path when that split eventually becomes clear to the characters. And I'm excited to see. So that's my prediction for whether they're going to be more like Vox Machina or if they're going to be more like the Mighty Nine and go down different routes. I think they're going to be more like Vox Machina with some of them going like, why don't we go over here? That looks fun. 
But uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on episode two. Uh, overall, very good. We got a ton of good character stuff out of most of them. Uh, obviously, not everyone's going to get their time to shine right away. And it's going to be a slow slow burn. That's D&D. It takes a while to get totally into where your story is and to get locked into it. And Matt's story is going to change depending on where they want to go. So if you're looking for, I want the main villain introduced right now, you're going to have to look elsewhere. Like, the main villain of Campaign 2 wasn't introduced until they went back to check on Molly Mock's grave. So, like, you know, I think that's a, a very good... I mean, technically not with the Chain of Oblivion being the, the central villain. But you know what I mean. The the final threat was there for Lucian slash Molly Mock. And it wasn't introduced until relatively close to the end. So, I highly doubt that'll happen again with how long it took for them to get to that point. But I do think whatever story we do get and whatever central conflict we get will be just as good as the other two games. Obviously, there isn't going to be a story or a conflict from beginning to end to last the whole way up. You need a level 1 to 5 story. You need a level 5 to 10. You need a level 10 to 15, 15 to 20. You know, you need that kind of uh, a burn to your story. You can't... You need arcs. You need anime arcs for this kind of stuff. So... You know, if you're looking for a give me the main villain right now sort of thing, curve your expectations. And that's something they've been saying this whole time. Curve your expectations about this campaign. It's going to be way different. And I honestly have been enjoying the huge differences between this campaign and the last. It makes it feel like something, you know, it was going to be worth watching before. But it's different enough now to where it's like, good, this is new, this is entertaining, and I'm enjoying the shit out of it. So with that all being said, uh, I want to thank everybody again. Uh, my last two videos performed extremely well again. You guys are killing it. Uh, I appreciate everyone commenting. And, you know, I'm very grateful for all of you being here. And this is going to be a fun journey. So with that, I'm Zodiac Bandit. And I will see you next time.